This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings and welcome to this, our service of worship. My name is Kim Henning. Pastor Coley and I have been called as pastors of Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. We are honored to serve you. We are blessed to live our lives in your midst. If we had a Sunday bulletin in hand, you would see on the back side of the bulletin that the ministers of this community are all of us, all who confess the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for coming together as the church. Thank you for being what Paul referred to as the body of Christ. Before we begin, I'd like to share some announcements of things that I'm aware of. First, I need to say thing, something about location. I'm standing in front of what we traditionally know as Hamilton Memorial Home. Hamilton Memorial Home is a care facility in Two Rivers. In fact, Hamilton Memorial Home is our church's next door neighbor. Uh, the church, Grace Congregational Church, is just over here to the north, uh, and, and this is our next door neighbor. So why am I here? The scripture you'll be hearing later is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is the Apostle Paul's instruction to the church on love. So what do you think of when you think of love? We've heard quite a lot in recent weeks about the selfless work of healthcare workers. Today, I'd like to stretch that a bit. When I think of selfless love, I think of those employees who work at places like this. When we age, when we are disabled, when we are no longer able to care for ourselves, many of us rely upon the services of others at a place like this, Hamilton Memorial Home. When I think, when I listen to the Apostle Paul's description of love, I want to be aware of those who serve our elderly. I have one more announcement to share with you. As this is being prepared for you, I have several updates to share with you. Updates that have occurred since our Wednesday email to you. Uh, first of all, Marilyn Dunlap is no longer at Aurora Bay Care in Green Bay. She is now at Shady Lane in Manitowoc. Al Nelson, as of today, is still at Next Step in Felician Village, but he plans on coming home on Saturday Coral Rose Kirkheat uh, recovers from her uh, knee surgery at home. Sherry Stiefvater had surgery today. Um, and Aaron Sanulitz, the son of Adam and Christy, had surgery and is now recovering at home. So let me say what you already know. For 2,000 years, the church has honored Sunday as a day to celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Let us prepare ourselves for this grand and holy event of Christian worship. Good morning, Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. My name is Larry Peterson. I am the chairperson of the Pastor Parish Committee for Pastor Coley Bativia. I come before you with an exciting announcement this morning. On Saturday, May 9th, Lancaster Theological Seminary the School of the United Church of Christ conferred on Pastor Coley Bativia a Doctorate of Ministry degree. For the past two years, Pastor Coley has studied, participated in lectures, and written her thesis paper. And now we are pleased to announce that she has completed all of that work. Her formal title is the Reverend Dr. Coley Bativia. Our community is blessed by you, Pastor Coley, and your family Tobin and Lincoln. We are grateful for your love of the church, your ministry, and your commitment to be the servant of the gospel. On behalf of our church, we offer you our sincere congratulations. We love you, Pastor Coley. May God continue to bless and guide you. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus.
Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And when I am alone, and when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world. Give me Jesus, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when I come to die, and when I come to die, oh, when I come to pass give me Jesus yeah give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have all this world give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have all this world you can have all this world yeah you can have all this world give me Jesus Greetings to you in the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Years ago, the Apostle John wrote these words to the church. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Be beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we esteem you and we honor you above all else. You are the beloved who brought this world into being. You are the beloved who guided Abraham and Sarah to the promised land. You are the beloved who liberated the Hebrews from captivity in Egypt. And you are the beloved who came to us in Jesus Christ. As we remember your presence in our midst, we are mindful of the ways we have fallen short of your high calling of faith. When we ask, what's in it for me? Lord, have mercy, please. When we trust that someone else will care for the weak and the broken of this world, Lord, have mercy when we ignore the high calling of faith and the high calling of love and the high calling of hope lord have mercy be present with with us we pray as we seek to follow the pathway of jesus christ our lord amen in the united church of christ the denomination of which we are a part we say that the statements of faith and the creeds that we recite together are not tests of faith but testimonies meaning that there is 
no test, no strict guideline that you have to believe this or else you're out. We leave room for a variety of interpretations, a variety of different beliefs, and yet hold these statements as important to us as testimonies. They were handed down to us from our ancestors in faith and models for us about what our faith might look like when we say we believe in God. So with that in mind, I invite you to join with me in the words to our United Church of Christ statement of faith. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your Church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm, which has no end, blessing and honor, glory and power beyond to you. Amen. you a prayer where the psalmist acknowledges the strength of God, God's presence in his life. It is a beautiful thing to know that our lives, day by day, are being protected and blessed by God. Please pray with me. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to, say, to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the gasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my help, my trust, my O oh Lord, 
from their youth upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Good morning. I'm Aaron Buchholz. I'll be uh, reading your scripture this morning. First, uh, this reading will be from Luke 4, chapters 21 through 30. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he appeared at a worship service in his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus read a, texture, a text of scripture from Isaiah. When he finished, we hear the hometown folk spoke very favorably of Jesus. But that mood changes when Jesus talks about the far-reaching love of God. Listen to God's word. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is it not, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do you hear also in your home town the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum? And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there are many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard all this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill in which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the, through the midst of them and went on his way. So in our Bible story today, Paul talks about love. And he says, even if I am really, really smart, and I can do all sorts of amazing and impressive things, but I don't have love, none of that means anything. Nothing else matters without love. And the way that Paul describes it, love is not so much an emotion or a feeling that you have inside yourself. Love is an action. Love is a thing that we do, a way that we act and behave towards other people. If we love them, we show that by acting in a certain way. Paul then goes on to list a whole bunch of things to describe this kind of love. He says that love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, meaning it's content with what is. Love doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant, meaning that it is humble. Love isn't rude, Paul says. It doesn't seek its own advantage, meaning that love is not selfish, but instead it looks to help and to serve other people. Love isn't irritable, meaning it's not grumpy or grouchy. Love does not keep a record of complaints, meaning that love forgives other people. Love fights for justice. Love is happy with the truth. Love keeps going. Love trusts others and trusts in others, Paul says, meaning that love supports other people. Love is hopeful and love endures. It lasts and lasts and keeps going. But so we have this list of things that describe love and we all love other people, right? There are people in this world that we care about, but none of us are perfect. None of us do things right all the time. And so when you love someone, whether it's someone that you're married to or someone who is in your family or someone who's a friend or a neighbor or a classmate or maybe someone else in church. When we really do love someone, we are supposed to act in this way. But none of us are perfect. We all struggle with some things. And so when you think about this list of all the things that Paul says love is, 
I want you to spend some time and think about what on this list is something that you're good at. What comes easy to you when you love other people? What do you do the best? And then on the other hand, which do you struggle with? Of all these things, the ways that we act when we love someone, what is hardest for you to do? I want you to choose one of these aspects of love. Maybe not the hardest, but it could be, but one of the ones that's harder for you and practice it this week. Perhaps practice being kind, or maybe practice not being grumpy, or maybe practice forgiving other people, or maybe practice enduring, trying again and again, and keeping going with someone that you love. Choose one of these things and practice it this week in your relationships. That is my challenge for you. So I'm going to give you a moment uh, with the music that plays next and invite you to think about this, to consider all these different words that describe love, which is easiest, comes most naturally to you, which one is hardest and challenging, and what might you practice this in the week ahead. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you that before all else, you love us. And that gives us the strength, the courage, the peace to love all others in this world. Help us to practice this love, to show forth the actions that you call us to, to care for others around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture before us is 1 Corinthians 13, written by the Apostle Paul. Listen for God's word. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. 
It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. These are words of Holy Scripture. The Church believes they can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God, who comes to us decisively in Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. I learned a new word this week. Uh, I, I noticed this word for the first time on Monday as I was reading a commentary on 1 Corinthians 13. I, I had never seen the word before, so I think I did what's natural for many of us. I, I skipped over the word and I kept on reading. On Tuesday, I picked up another commentary on 1 Corinthians 13, and sure enough, the word appeared again. This time, I paused. <laughs> I said to myself, I've seen that word before, but I was too lazy to pick up a dictionary. <laughs> then came Thursday. Not once, not twice, but three times, this strange new word appeared. I, I said to myself, that's enough. The word encomium. No less than five times I read that 1 Corinthians 13 is an encomium of love. An encomium is an expression of praise. An encomium is a lavish tribute. As funerals, we hear eulogies spoken on behalf of the person who died. A, a eulogy is meant to be a complimentary tribute to someone who has passed. Years ago, Paul wrote a letter to that small gathering of Christians in Corinth, Greece. He wrote about the cross. He, you cannot be Christian without the cross. Paul wrote about human idolatries. He, he wrote about Holy Communion. He wrote about this mysterious organism called the church. And then Paul devoted an entire chapter to the wonder of love. Read it slowly. It is too important to skim our way through. 1 Corinthians 13 is an encomium of love. It's a lavish tribute to the importance of love. If, if you are interested, a person can visit the site of that early church in Corinth, Greece, or if you want it, much easier, you can see it on the internet. In the center of the plaza is a stone pillar. It is perhaps three, four feet wide, maybe more. On one side, 1 Corinthians 13 is written in the original Greek. On the second side, 1 Corinthians 13 is written in English. What does it mean to be human in the best sense of the word? Uh, what do we hope to accomplish with this small, one precious life we live before we die? Uh, what is it that swells the human heart like nothing else? Uh, what is it that brings us together and keeps us together as a Christian community? I offer a one-word answer, love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, 
but do not have love, I gain nothing. How does the Apostle Paul begin his encomium of love? He says that if we remove love from the human experience, we are left with a meaningless, empty, void experience of life. Ralph Jacobson is bold to say that Paul here makes what is perhaps the most polemical, potentially controversial statement of his entire ministry. We put so much emphasis on electronics. We put so much emphasis on sports. We put so much emphasis on the economy, on academics, on technical skills. Uh, those are each dust in the wind compared to agape, love. Paul said that the tongue of an angel is not greater than love. Paul said that the ability to be prophetic like Jeremiah or Martin Luther King Jr. is not greater than love. Paul said that faith, faith like that of Elijah, is not to be desired more than the practice of love. And he went one step further to those of us who are capitalists. Give away everything you have and become like Francis of Assisi means nothing alongside of love. Hundreds of years ago, the apostle, hundreds of years before the apostle Paul, Moses stood before the Hebrews and announced, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. You shall love, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Loving God with every fiber of your being is what Paul said we should do with our lives. When the Apostle Paul wrote that epistle to the church, he, he, he said, ever so simply, God is love. Uh, the season of the coronavirus is, is so striking. Some of us have been shaken by our social isolation. Some of us have been unnerved by the shakiness of the economy. Some of us are starved for a handshake or a hug. The love of God, the steadfast love of God, the scriptures announce, is the rock that steadies the human soul. Long about now, it would seem right to have some sort of definition of love. Wouldn't you agree? And that is what the Apostle Paul does. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Uh, I don't know if you were counting or not. Paul defines love in 15 different ways. Eight times, eight times Paul describes what is contrary to the way of love, seven times Paul describes what is the heart of love. What is contrary to love? Envy. What is contrary to love? Boastfulness, arrogance, rude. Love is my way or the highway. Love is not being resentful. Love does not snicker at another's failure. And the positive side? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love endures. Love hopes. Love believes. Years ago, I had an aunt who died eventually through um, Alzheimer's because of Alzheimer's disease. My, my uncle, bless his soul, talked about spending all kinds of time in a parked car, so, sometimes an hour or more, as he waited for her to get ready to get out of the car. You talk, he said, and you wait. You wait and you talk. It takes something of God, does it not, to become something of a person like that? And how does Paul conclude? Love never ends. Powerful kingdoms, they all come to an end. Powerful countries will not always be powerful. Dynasties will have their day in the sun, but night will come. Love never ends. At the close of this letter, Paul announces the smallness of the human being 
in the shadow of love. Human beings know only a little bit. Human beings prophesy only a little bit. And then Paul says that those committed to love must be committed to the growing process. So much of life, Paul says, it is childish. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Isn't that interesting? Love is not for the immature. Love in all of its fullness is not for childlike behaviors. To be childlike, it's all about me. To be childlike, it's mine, it's mine. To be childlike, we cry when we don't get our way. Love, Paul announces, requires adult-like behavior. And then Paul some, says something rather stunning. He says the same thought, he repeats the same thought twice. Now we see in a mirror dimly. And then he says, now we know only in part. What does Paul mean to be saying? Not one of us arrives at a point of being the fullness of love here on earth. The fullness of love is with the hereafter. Not one of us, not one of us can claim to be professional practitioners of love here on earth. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. I'd like to close with two thoughts. On the other side of town, across the river, our community has two cemeteries. On one of the gravestones of one of our members, this couple has their name, they list their children, they have their date of birth, and they have their date of death. And the other piece of information on their gravestone, now we see in a mirror dimly, then we will see face to face. The lives we live here are imperfect. Our strongest convictions are imperfect. But the day is coming, a day is coming, when we will see face to face. And finally, let's agree that 1 Corinthians 13 is the Apostle Paul's encomium of love. Something I've noticed in 1 Corinthians 13 is that Paul does not refer in this chapter to God or to Jesus or to the Holy Spirit. I find that a bit troubling because the entirety of Paul's writing is, is about God's revelations through all of history and God's participation with us. The epitome of love is God. Isn't that clear? The fullness, the most extreme display of love is Jesus and the pathway to the cross. And what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit but the infusion of love into the hearts and soul of humankind? In closing, it does not seem an exaggeration at all to say with the Apostle Paul, Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind, Jesus is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, Jesus does not insist on his own way, Jesus is not irritable or resentful, Jesus does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. Please pray with me. Gracious God, it seems like forever since we last gathered as a community and our patience seems to be wearing thin. We are lonely for each other. We are lonely for the faces of children. We are lonely for the sound of the choir. We are lonely for the enjoyment of refreshments with each other and for the laughter and the tears and for the friends we have grown little by little, conversation by conversation. We are strengthened, O oh God, by the promise you have made to be with us and for us.
through all of life. When we were baptized, we learned of your enduring love, and we heard of your forever covenant, and we were blessed with the knowledge that during the most difficult and challenging times of life, you would be with us. What a gift you've given us, O oh God. We praise you, O oh wonder of wonders. We praise you, the great I am. We praise you, O oh God, for these miraculous bodies that heal after we've been injured. We praise you for the signs of spring daffodils and tulips and budding trees, for birds singing. We praise you, O oh God of love, for planting your spirit within human beings. Through you, mothers and fathers and grandparents have become more patients. Through you, we know that teachers and hospital workers and police are vigilant and tender in their care. And through you, we want to be mindful of those who care for the elderly, those who give comfort and respite to those who are struggling, for those who show compassion, for no, those who know that they are called by you to bless others by the way we live our lives. We offer our prayers, O oh God, for those in need. We pray for our shut-ins, for those who are even more confined than most of us. We pray for Shirley, for Doris, for Jean, for Ruth, for Jack, for Marcia, for Rico, for William, for Bill and Sandy, for Bert and Judy, for Bonnie, for Joyce, for Joan and Ron, for Marion, for Helen, for Ron, for Lil Pashik, for Bruce and Leslie, for Jean, for Bob, for Sue, for Ginny, and for Flossie, and for Jim. We pray for Jean and for Peggy. And we are mindful also of those who have been hospitalized. We pray for the continued well-being and healing of Coral Rose, for Sherry, for Aaron Sonulitz, for Diane and Al, and for Marilyn Dunlap. We trust you, O oh God, with these very fragile lives we live. We do not live to ourselves, we do not die to ourselves, but in all of life, we trust you to be the one who leads us onward and forward. Listen now, as together, we pray the prayer that was taught us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Grace family and friends. I hope this all finds you well. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jennifer Rinke. I live here in Two Rivers with my husband, Tony. We have four children, Tia and Trevor, who are grown, and then we have Joey and Olivia, who are both five. I want to take you a little bit down my faith journey and what brings me here today. Uh, growing up, I was baptized into the Catholic Church, and I went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, I even did a year of Catholic college. And I'm, I, I'm thankful for that faith foundation that my parents gave me, because I firmly believe in um, faith and uh, giving children a good, solid foundation to grow up on. For me, though... Um, even though, you know, pretty much six out of the seven days a week, we went to church. But to me, going to church should make you feel good inside and give you those warm fuzzies all over and not feel like it's cold and lonely and isolated, which to me, when I went to church, that was how I felt. And being Catholic, you went to church six out of seven days a week. Um, so for many years, even though I was raised in going to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, um, once I was in high school and I could drive, I would go with my friends to their churches. And um, I went to Baptist church, I went to Lutheran church, um, trying to find my way and to try and find that sense of belonging. So when Tony and I were about to get married, um, I told him that's really what I want, is I want a place that um, I feel welcome and want to go and participate in things or hang out with my church family um, and not made to feel like it's cold and lonely and sterile and you just go through the motions of being there. And so we church shopped. We went to different churches um, on Sundays and um, Tony said we should try Grace because he had worked with Pastor Kim as a funeral director and um, so we, we tried Grace and um, I'm very thankful for that because I finally feel like I belong. It took many years to feel like I belong and now I have found my home and I can't thank Grace enough. And I don't know if you know, but um, my husband and I are foster parents. So um, that is how Joey and Livy came to us. And um, so some weekends you see us come in and we have Joey and Livy and other weekends you see us come in with a few more kids. I know in the Catholic Church that, yes, we would be welcome with, you know, the fostering aspect of it, but not the noise that accompanies bringing children into church. Growing up in the Catholic Church, you were to be seen and not heard. At least that was my impression and how I felt. So you went and you sat in your pew and you folded your hands and you bowed your head. Um... Well, I can tell you that um, Joey, being autistic, um, does not grasp that concept at five. And um, 
and our little darling Olivia, who is very curious and inquisitive, who oftentimes interrupts Pastor Coley or Pastor Kim and asks questions during the children's service. I can't thank our Grace family enough for letting them be there and and interrupt church um, and not make us feel or myself feel shameful for them doing that. Um, and so I, I just, it, it warms my heart to know that I have a place that I can come and feel welcome and my family feels welcome. Um, but I'll never regret growing up in the Catholic church um, because it gave me a solid foundation um, and a base layer, I can call it, um, for growing and being who I am today. So um, thank you very much and um, many blessings to you all. The church is a community of people like you and me who have devoted themselves to the upward call of faith. When we are at our best, it is beautiful to know the impact the church and the gospel have upon the lives of people. Together we pray. Together we listen to God's word. Together we practice the art of community. During this time when we typically receive an offering, I invite you to consider the ways that your life is blessed by Christ and this church ministry. forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render unto no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen.